Good afternoon, and welcome to yet another extremely topical, extremely timely and informative Emet webinar. After a brutal reign of 20 years, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of the Justice and Development Party, or AKP, has finally faced a bit of opposition. Erdogan has been a brutal human rights violator, arbitrarily imprisoning opposition leaders, journalists, intellectuals, professors, and gays. Under Erdogan, the Turkish parliament has passed draconian laws to restrict and curtail freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and an independent judiciary. Although Turkey is a member of NATO in 2017, Turkey purchased the all-powerful or extremely powerful S-400 missile defense system from Russia and has managed to dance a rather delicate balancing act on both sides of the Russian-Ukrainian war. Historically, Turkey and Israel had enjoyed extremely warm ties. Turkey was the first Muslim-majority nation to recognize the establishment of the State of Israel back in 1949. However, after Erdogan came to power, things began to go south. Although I have to say in March of 2022, diplomatic ties were uh, re-engaged between Ankara and Jerusalem and Israeli President Isaac Herzog to visit Ankara for the first time since 2007 um, when um, President uh, Perez had vis visited Ankara. Um, so in August of 2022, diplomatic ties were restored between Turkey and Israel, yet we remain extremely concerned about President Erdogan's real attitudes towards the Jewish state. For example, on May 8th, President Erdogan tweeted, we strongly condemn Israel's heinous attacks against our first Qibla, or the Al-Aqsa Mosque, that are unfortunately being carried out every Ramadan, and in his UN address on September 27, 22nd, rather, 2020, um, Prime Minister Erdogan wrongly, or President Erdogan wrongly accused Israel of extending its, quote, dirty hand over Jerusalem and, quote, occupation and oppression in Palestine, prompting Israel's UN envoy to walk um, out of the General Assembly Hall. Um, Ankara hosts and um, has regaled the importance of Hamas. Turkey has been grappling lately with wide-scale inflation and a very devastating earthquake, which killed approximately 50,000 of its people. Last Sunday, many of us had reason for hope. Six opposition parties coalesced ar um, around the opposition candidate, and I know I am going to butcher this name, um, Kamal um, Klutch, uh, see, now I'm helping out here. Uh, <laughs> the HP party. <laughs> okay. How is how is the name pronounced? It's uh it's Kalich Darolu. Kalich Darolu, thank you. <laughs> oh, however, unfortunately, the results of the election were much too close. Um, in order to win, a candidate has to obtain 50% of the vote. Runoff elections are now scheduled for May 28th. So now we are in a bit of a cliffhanger. We are extremely honored to have with us today um, from the wonderful Foundation for Defense of Democracy, an expert on Turkish domestic and international affairs, um, Sinan Sidi. Sinan also um, is an associate professor of national security studies at the Marine Corps University and he was the executive director of the Institute of Turkish Studies at Georgetown University. Um, he continues to serve as an adjunct associate professor at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. Sinan has written one book um, on Kemalism in Turkish politics, um, the Republican People's Party, Secularism and Nationalism, um, which focuses on the electoral weakness of the Republican People's Party and has written scores and scores of articles. Sinan obtained his PhD from um, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London in 2007 in the field of political science. 
He continues to author scholarly articles, opinion pieces, and book chapters on contemporary Turkish politics and foreign policy, as well as participate in multiple media appearances. Sinan, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, first of all, if you can, please explain to us who um, the opposition party leader is and what he represents to a very large segment of the Turkish population. Um, well, first of all, sir, thank you for having me. Um, I know, we, you know, uh, we've communicated a lot to get the schedule, so I appreciate everybody's hard effort to get this um, on the books and also in, in person live. And I appreciate for everybody basically listening to this. And you're right. It is a cliffhanger um, and, uh, you know, what, what's going on in Turkey. So at least the only thing I can say in Mr. Erdogan's favor is he, he keeps it interesting. <laughs> um, so the first thing that we can actually say, you know, in terms of, you know, who he's up against, who he, who Mr. Erdogan has been facing off against um, uh, for the last while is this uh, interesting person, uh, Mr. Kemal Kılıç Darolu, uh, who is 74 years old. Uh, although he's quite spry uh, and and can be energetic and 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 uh, and an interesting personality, by training and experience, he is a bureaucrat. He used to run the country's social security administration uh, before he joined the, uh, the 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 Republican People's Party, or which goes by the acronym of CHP, which also is the founding party of the Republic of Turkey, or the, or the one that was created by Atatürk back in the nineteen twenties. Right, it's literally the founding party of Turkey, and he is like he is the most recent chairman of it since 2010. So he's been in that role for quite a while um, and, has, and has been a lifelong member of that party. And, uh, and he's tried to essentially go up against Erdogan uh, for several successive elections. And unfortunately, he doesn't seem to have the sort of the magic sort of touch, so to speak, or to, to unseat him. But then again, nobody seems to have. Uh, Mr. Erdogan has been in power or has led this country one way or another, uh, either as prime minister or as president since 2003. Um, I actually remember uh, when I was a graduate student uh, in my first year in 2002, um, the night that the Justice and Development Party, Mr. Erdogan, um, was elected for the first time on November 3. And we were at the BBC studios in London at the Turkish service covering the night of the elections. And I do remember one of my colleagues asking because he was an unknown quantity, his Erdogan and his entire team who just won their election for the first time, standing on a balcony and waving at the, at the, um, at the crowd that was jubilant, saying to me, well, who, who are these people? Um, and the response basically came back with another colleague just looking at both of us saying, I don't know, but we're about to find out. And basically 21 years has, 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 taken, has, has passed since then. Uh, and Erdogan doesn't appear to be any weaker than he, than he, than he um, well, at least politically, than he has been. But Mr. Kulish is is essentially you know, a bureaucrat is um, coming into politics later on in the game. Um, and he will face off against Mr. Erdogan in, in just under two weeks time, again on a Sunday. Uh, it is unprecedented to the extent that Turkey has never had this sort of runoff election before, right? Turkey until 2017 was a parliamentary system of government uh, whereby voters, you know, chose uh, their, 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 their parliamentarians the parliament maintained uh, uh, the, the, the privilege of being the legislature from which a cabinet uh, belonging to the largest majority party or coalition would be basically form the executive branch of the government, right? Uh, with the prime minister, right? And that would be, and it would gain a good vote of confidence essentially and, you know, execute the business of government. With the installation of the presidential system in 2017, uh, Turkey has really changed tune. It's changed its system of government, right? Now, uh, we have an all-powerful president, uh, and that president is not constrained by much, right? The the institution of checks and balances has basically all but disappeared. Um, and let me put it to you this way. Uh, how does this work? So President Erdogan, or whoever is the next president, could literally wake up tomorrow morning and say and decree uh, that every citizen in the country has to wear a yellow vest. And that would have the full force of law. It could not be rescinded by an act of parliament or any veto. It could not be annulled by the courts, including the constitutional court. Um, and that's it. Or conversely, uh, parliament could legislate and, and pass a law or a bill. If the president didn't like it, uh, they could veto it, right? And send it back down. Um, so the, the office of the presidency has become extremely powerful under Erdogan. 
since 2017. And Mr. Kulich Thurula basically campaigned on this notion of, you know, enough is enough. Uh, our main intention is to essentially run a campaign such that we are going to reinstitutionalize democratic governance in Turkey, uh, which would look like the reinstitutionalization of a parliamentary system. Uh, and, and that is not likely to happen, unfortunately, because on Sunday, what just happened is, uh, although no one candidate won the outright uh, presidency because they failed to achieve 50% of the vote, uh, the, 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 the actual parliament seats have been distributed. The parliamentary elections are confirmed. And right now, the majority of seats in the parliament go to a coalition between Mr. Erdogan's party and the far right uh, nationalist movement party, which means that the opposition is in no position to pass a, uh, a constitutional amendment that could change the country back to a parliamentary system. And on top of that, what we're what we're looking at is on May 28th, when the runoff does happen against Mr. Erdogan and Mr. Kulich Tharoglu, it is more likely, although not confirmed or, or certain, it is more likely, though, I would say, that Mr. Erdogan does win the presidency for a third term in office, which would give him, basic, again, uh, total control of the Turkish uh, uh, government, which is not what his critics uh, uh, and, and, and international partners and allies in Turkey were hoping for. But unfortunately, that's what it is essentially looking at. So just by way of starting off. Oh, terrific. So um, The Economist recently wrote that if Erdogan wins this time, Turkey will become, quote, a full-blown dictatorship. Um, and by the way, it was impossible to find a copy, according to my friends, of this in Ankara, of this, uh, this article from The Economist. Um, how far, if re-elected, do you think, believe Erdogan will um, slip into this autocracy? You know, so that's a really good question. I think, you know, people are justifiably worried for the worst because there is nothing that can constrain him. I mean, he has, read, he has led a pretty vicious electoral campaign that was predicated upon divisiveness and polarization. He's really sort of dug deep into these sort of polarizing positions of identity, which have really inflamed voters. But it seems to have resonated with one out of two voters. Erdogan got almost 49.5% of the vote um, with the highest, one of the highest turnouts in Turkish electoral history. 90% of people turned out to vote, eligible voters. So, and that platform was essentially pretty anti-Western, uh, pretty anti-LGBTQ. It was anti-immigration, anti-sort of inclusiveness, right? Um, and really sort of dug deep into the fault lines of Turkey's you know, divisions um, against Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu's campaign, which was based on unity and sort of democratization and reinstitutionalization of the rule of law. Um, and how far will Mr. Erdogan go down this? It's hard to say. We'll have to see if he wins, what that will essentially look like, right? In terms of what his priorities are going to be. Uh, one of the big worries is basically that he could use this as a pretext upon taking office for a third term to essentially really uh, sort of circle the wagons on um, eliminating the last vestiges of independent media, critical thought. There are some, you know, some of this is still alive in Turkey, believe it or not. There is a, you know, vibrant, um, you know, independent media. Uh, a lot of this is sort of web-based, some of it's TV channels, um, as well as radio. Um, there are widespread worries that that could essentially be completely terminated, right? Um, I've heard from, you know, on the private that many journalists, as well as businessmen and the business community are planning for an, a possible exodus out of the country because they feel that individual freedoms, liberties and lack of rule of law means they can't, they don't really have breathing room. On the other hand, one of the big constraining factors going forward for Erdogan will be, look, the, the economic situation is in a, is in a pretty bad state. Um, the country's inflation is amongst the top three highest in inflations in the world. Uh, you know, inflation unofficially is probably somewhere hovering around 100 to 130 percent. Officially, it's just below 50 percent, but it's uh, you know, it's 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 really high. Um, the middle class, as a result of that, and their incomes have basically eroded. Uh, Turkey may experience a high level of balance of payments issues because the government. And the treasury is indebted to numerous external entities and countries, and the and 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 the treasury is empty, right? Um, the government has spent billions of dollars daily 
to essentially stabilize and prop up the lira. So immediately upon taking office, Erdogan will have to basically really address economic concerns if he's to have a stable country. So rather than go down this rule or, um, road of authoritarianism and autocracy and really circling wagons, to what extent will he focus his message and his government on economic orthodoxy or economic sort of management and prudence, we'll have to see. But I think going forward in the medium term, absolutely, he will use this, I think, in my estimation, to really sort of dig down into trying to um, entrench and solidify and consolidate this authoritarian rule to the extent that, um, you know, there aren't many things standing in his way to prevent it. But I should also say, before taking the next question, is he does appear to be not as spry and as in good health as he once was. The sort of thundering Erdogan that we're accustomed to seeing on TV, on international sort of um, uh, uh, outlets and, and, and you know, in, in conferences and, 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 and summits, right? When he sort of blusters at people, you know, he had a big health scare during this election where we, you know, he was off taken off the election circuit for about 48 hours. It seemed to be pretty serious. We've heard all sorts of rumors from the fact that it was a heart attack, epilepsy, to a possible minor stroke. Who knows? It wasn't released, but he was off the trail for 48 hours. And if you see his complexion and his persona now, he doesn't look well, right? So one of the things that, that could be, we could be anticipating is, yes, he wins the election possibly and goes forward as president, but he might be looking to name and basically groom a successor um, should that happen. And I don't know necessarily who that would be because Turkey, again, has no experience in this realm. Um, it, it's never groomed the successor. We just historically have elections and there's always been a peaceful transfer of power and the, 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 the elector's choice has been respected. So I'm not sure how successful he could be in that endeavor, but I think he's going to have to find a way to continue what he wants to do as government, but also hopefully pass that on to somebody else because I don't think he's in a physical condition to be able to sort of stay under this sort of lens of immense pressure going forward. Wonderful. Can you, or not so wonderful, can you explain um, Turkey under Erdogan's relationship with NATO and its relationship with Russia? So Turkey has been a, a member of NATO since 1952. Um, and historically, even, even up until recent times, has been credited with being a very functional member of NATO. It's always been a sort of proactive. It was very active in in in, in you know in peacekeeping operations such as Kosovo, uh, but also you know um, you know supported NATO actions in Afghanistan, or um, uh, as well as just being a good sort of actor within it historically. Right? It, it has troops, it has willpower, and it has you know it, it has had a historically positive sway within the organization. Recently, under Erdogan, though, particularly since two thousand fifteen, I would argue with the with the rise of the Islamic State sort of threat in in the region. Um, and the divergent sort of goals and the falling out of the relationship between Turkey and the United States, uh, Erdogan's sort of use of and behavior within NATO has, has been a tool to leverage his own interests. So what do we mean by that? Well, for example, um, Erdogan, uh, like every other NATO country, uh, or, you, know, sh you know, should have welcomed the application and inclusion of Sweden and Finland, which basically desire to become members of NATO because of the perceived Russian threat following the invasion of Ukraine, well, Erdogan held that up and is still holding up uh, 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 Sweden's membership, right? It's not ratifying, it's not approving it. He said in principle he's in favor, but in practice he's saying that he has some security concerns which he would like those countries to address before he approves and ratifies their membership. What are those concerns? Well, basically, he's basically saying he, uh, Turkey has concerns over these countries harboring Kurdish terrorists, quote unquote. Um, Finland has never essentially crossed, uh, you know, been at crosshairs with Turkey over sort of the Kurdish issue. And um, there was a lot of pressure put immediately on Turkey saying, look, Finland has nothing to do with anything just to prove their membership. Sweden historically has um, sort of welcomed people of all different stripes and colors as well as, as well as political persuasions including Kurdish dissidents but also members of the separatist PKK entity which which has found a sort of a domicile inside of Sweden and Turkey is essentially you know said is holding the server NATO uh, by preventing their membership but the message is more intended towards the United States saying look you're not giving me what I want in my, in my part of the world which is 
Turkey would like to buy new fighter aircraft from the United States, F-16 fighters. It would like to upgrade its modern, present fleet. And this has been blocked by Congress. Uh, and the administration here is kind of like, would like to help Turkey out, but looking to Congress saying, well, I can't do anything unless you come through for us. So it's this sort of tit for tat. Um, and then Mr. Erdogan saying, well, fine, that's fine. And in turn, he's used uh, the blocking of Finnish and Swedish membership of NATO in his electoral campaign. He has fired up his base of voters at home saying, See, we don't kowtow and bow to the unreasonable requests of the West, especially the United States, uh, when they don't respect our security concerns. And I'm not going to uh, ratify their membership until I'm satisfied. That has given him a huge bump, right? People think he's a, believe him to be a strong leader, a decisive leader, right? A, a person who tells it to the West, you know, um, who sort of shows them that he's not going to just bow down under Western pressure. So... What we're expecting is essentially after the election May, on May 28, um, Turkey is likely to ratify Sweden's membership because at that point, it will cease to be an election issue. Now, the second part of your question is this also is part and parcel of Turkey's relationship with Russia. So Turkey is also leveraging its position, uh, his relation, its relationship with Vladimir Putin as a means to sort of ensure that the West doesn't really uh, sort of strike against Erdogan hard by imposing sanctions or imposing further punitive measures or not selling Turkey fighter planes. So since the Ukrainian war started, Turkey immediately has said, well, look, we're up against a, a sort of uh, a problem here. We'd like to, so we, you know, in, 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 nominally we respect Ukraine's independence and, 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 and feel for their fight and we support their brave campaign to be rid of foreign invasion, but, we're also not willing to back the full barrage of Western sanctions against Russians, because if we do, we would be disproportionately economically hurt. Turkey derives approximately 40 to 50 percent of its natural gas needs from Russia. It relies on a huge amount of tourism revenues from Russia to the tune of about 10 to 20 billion dollars a year. Right. Turkey's agricultural sector ex exports somewhere to the tune of 10 billion dollars worth of produce to Russia on an annual basis. So. Mr. Putin could cut this off should, should he feel that Erdogan is crossing him. On the other hand, Mr. Erdogan said to the West and NATO, well, look, guys, I can't back the full barrage of sanctions, but here's what I'll do. I will sell the Ukrainians our latest TB2 uh, uh, military drones, which have been very decisive in undermining Russia's military capabilities in the war. Uh, they're now selling them also uh, the Turkish version of Bradley armored personnel carriers, which helps the Ukrainians in maneuver warfare on the ground. Uh, Turkey has also essentially proved extremely useful in facilitating and mediating an agreement between the Russians and the Ukrainians that has allowed the shipment of Ukrainian grain to find international markets, which is no small feat because if the Ukrainian wheat doesn't find its way onto global markets, they were estimating there could be a famine that could affect 100 million people across the world, especially in the Middle East. So Turkey's playing both. So in effect, Turkey's playing both sides here. Right. Uh, and so Erdogan is basically, as a result of this, uh, ensured that the, the United States, the Congress hasn't taken further punitive measures against Turkey because they feel they need uh, Erdogan on, uh, with the Ukrainian campaign. Even though, as Sarah, you mentioned at the beginning, in 2019, Turkey purchased a weapon system from the Russians, which NATO, the United States, uh, Turkey's allies across the world saying, what the hell is happening? Why would you purchase a Russian missile defense system that can target and lock onto allied NATO aircraft when you could have brought the American version, when you could have bought the European version? You weren't tied down to one particular uh, uh, platform of missile defense technology, but you certainly were not, you should not have purchased the Russian system. So Turkey is essentially, since 2019, uh, had a limited amount of sanctions placed upon it that prevents them pr procuring military technology. Mm -hmm. But it has also been kicked off the F-35 program, which Turkey was you know, a part of in, in the manufacturing process. Um, and as a result, this is why it's demanding F-16s from the US because its present Air Force uh, fleet is aging and requires significant upgrades. Right. Um, okay, since the beginning of March, fault lines have emerged throughout the Middle East, um, certainly since Beijing 
brokered um, its agreement between Tehran and Riyadh. Um, could you describe the relationship that Turkey under Erdogan has with many of our GCC countries in the Middle East? That's a good question. So Turkey right now is in the midst of a sort of um, reset, a, a U-turn in its relationship with uh, you know, um, you know, GCC countries, but a large part of the Arab world. Erdogan did his best in the last, I would say, decade to burn a considerable number of bridges with many sort of Arab regimes and governments. Egypt, right? He basically called uh, Sisi a dictator and essentially cut ties. Um, UAE, he's very much sort of crossed hairs with them. Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, he's been at loggerheads with historically. Uh, we also mentioned at the beginning, Turkey essentially sort of really ripped apart its relationship, its strong relationship with Israel, going back to the late 2000s, right? Um, and, you know, it's kind of hopscotching back to some sort of livelihood since then. But Erdogan essentially has been has isolated himself in the region, right? Um, he thought he was going to have a greater voice in the region and really establish a, a, a sort of um, a Sunni arc, if you want to call it that of Sunni-minded governments that he essentially was going to have an outsized voice over. Um, and his focus of doing that was basically going to be spearheaded by toppling the Assad regime in Syria and hopefully installing a like-minded sort of Sunni regime in place of that, which Turkey would have gotten to control and essentially manage. Now that hasn't happened. And as a result of that, uh, what's gonna happen is basically he's going to have to eat his own words Right. And right now he's essentially figured out that whilst he's been trying to strong arm sort of Turkey's position into the region uh, and because that has not worked, he's now basically going around on a mea culpa and trying to shake hands and reinvent himself in the region such that, you know, Turkey cannot be isolated anymore. So he's talking to the Assad government. He's met with Egyptian President Sisi. You mentioned that he's already sort of welcomed and had a dialogue with the Israeli president and government. Um, he's also tried to sort of shake hands with the UAE um, uh, uh, leadership. Um, we'll see where that goes, whether he'll be able to achieve any meaningful reestablishment of ties and relationship. But if he doesn't, right, this is going to come to go to hurt him even more because Israel uh, has, since the Abraham Accords, really sort of broken out of its sort of, I, um, I would say, you know, uh, uniqueness in the region by establishing greater relationships with our partners and Muslim partners, which it didn't have before. Uh, it's entered into delimitation of maritime borders over natural gas rights with, with different powers, in, as well as Cyprus and Greece, right? Um, Turkey is very much alone here uh, at this point. And, you know, throughout late 2022 and going into this year, and certainly before the election cycle began, Erdogan initiated a whole series of, you know, uh, charm offensives, I called it, um, in terms of, you know, where he could get with this. We'll see where that goes. But you're right, you drew attention to another one uh, recently, you know, with the with the escalation of violence in, inside of Israel. Uh, Erdogan sort of in a phone call with the Iranian president said we should, you know, it, it, you know, it is incumbent upon us to basically take a stand and unify position against Israel. Right. Um, despite the sort of, you know, uh, establishment of ambassadors and whatnot. But you know, what's interesting about that is he said that during his election cycle, right, when he, again, that sort of message really resonates with his base voters, anti-Israeli, right, um, uh, rhetoric does resonate with his base voters. But he also said it at a time when the Israeli government is most distracted, right? It's got its own sort of, you know, pop political democratic protests inside of Israel, right? But it's also facing an escalatory sort of level of violence inside the country from Hamas and whatnot, which which he felt was, you know, you know, presented him with an opportunity to take a political hit, knowing full well that the Israeli government and authorities were too distracted. Now, following, if he is re-elected, um, I'd be surprised if he doesn't pursue a path of continued normalization or wanting to keep up sort of increased sort of ties with Israel diplomatically, because none of what he has said and done has broken Turkey out of its re regional um, isolation. And he'll have to continue that if he, if he wishes to have successful sort of foreign policy going forward. All right. And so now it's my complete honor and, and um, pleasure to hand it over to my wonderful colleague, Hussein Abubakar Mansour, 
who will read some of the questions that have come in and perhaps pose some of his own. Um, thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you very much, Sinan, for uh, such a timely uh, presentation. And thank you very much for all our audience who tuned in to our webinar or who sent us questions. Please continue to send us questions um, through the Q&A function uh, through Zoom. Sinan, we received a number of questions. Um, some of them are uh, a, a recurrent, so I'm going to try to combine uh, many of them. We received a lot of people uh, or many questions asking about the Kurds or the Kurdish issues. Uh, what are uh, exactly the different positions of each of the candidates regarding the Kurds? Uh, which candidate do you think is, is better for the uh, uh, Kurdish minority? And what is the current uh, political behavior or electoral behavior in, uh, of, of, Tur uh, of the Kurds in Turkey? Well, thank you for that question. So, um, so going into this election, the Kurds were kind of, uh, or the Kurdish political mainstream political movement that was represented by uh, the left green party, which is the new name of the Kurdish political movement has given itself in Turkey right now, the, the YSP. These, this, this, this party and the Kurdish political movement, which is pivotal because it has the ability to motivate and a huge vote bank, right? Towards a particular candidate, right? Um, and they certainly weren't in favor of um, channeling, that vote, channeling that vote to Mr. Erdogan. Right, the Kurds had no interest in this essentially um, voting for Erdogan, not least of all because Erdogan has jailed most of the political leadership of the Kurdish political movement, right? Salahattin Demirtas has been in jail since 2017, right? Because Erdogan sees him as a political threat. Uh, on the other hand, so you would think, well, that's a natural ally for, for Mr. Kulishtarolo and the alliance of six political parties, right? That is facing off against Erdogan. Well, they never ask or included the Kurdish party to join that alliance, right? And the reason is, well, they were afraid that if that was part of the formal alliance, Mr. Erdogan would say, see, Mr. Kulish Tarola and the alliance is in bed with terrorists, the Kurdish terrorists. So this sort of um, trepidation, this fear of being formally allied with the Kurdish political movement, mainstream movement has hamstrung the opposition's ability. That being said, despite that sort of being kept at an arm's distance by Mr. Kulish, they're all the Kurdish political movement, nevertheless, quite astutely backed Mr. Kulish, all this presidency. And if you look at the southeastern provinces, uh, which are historically Kurdish or most Kurdish dense population, overwhelmingly supported uh, Mr. Kulish, they're all this campaign, right? And they really did vote for him uh, as president. And that's never, never really happened before, right? I mean, the Kurds don't typically vote for the, the party of Ataturk or its candidate, but they did. Um, and, and, and even, you know, I had a big problem with this simply because as, as in a problem is like, I had a problem with Mr. Kulishro not adopting or formally taking on the Kurds as a part of his alliance because of his fear of being labeled a terrorist, quote unquote, lover. And the reason I had a problem with it was like, Mr. Erdogan, Never, regardless of what, you know, how, if, if the Kurds were allied with Kulish or not, they, he still accused them of being terrorists or loving being in bed with terrorists. And my main point would have been, if you, if you are a professional politician seeking office, if you don't take the risk of maximizing your vote and explaining to the electorate why Kurds are not terrorists or the mainstream political movement inside of Turkey is nothing to do with terrorists and you don't embrace them, um, you won't get anywhere. Now you look at Mr. Kulish you know, uh, vote tally. He got just under 45% or just, let's just call it, he got 45% against Mr. Erdogan's almost 50%. If the Kurds didn't vote for him, I would, I, I would, venture, I would guess that, that his vote share would probably be under 40%, right? Uh, almost definitely, right? So the Kurds are in this bind because going forward, they're damned if they do, damned if they don't. They probably know at this point that Mr. Kulish presidency is not going to happen. But they also don't know what to do, given that Mr. Erdogan is going to become president, because I can't necessarily see Mr. Erdogan sort of reopening negotiations with the Kurdish political movement to find a negotiated settlement, because he has basically so much demonized the Kurds going into this election cycle. Hussein, you might be muted. All right. Uh -huh. Thank you. We received also a number of questions, uh, basically asking you to, to uh, try to summarize uh, to us um, what are the main concerns that are driving uh, uh, the electoral behavior in, in this election? Is it the economy? Is it jobs? What are, what are exactly the main, what would you say are the main concerns that are driving the results? 
I think that's a good question. I think a post-mortem on the initial election results still has to be, um, you know, uh, completed in time. It's, it's a little raw at the moment. Um, so my, my, my hunch is this, you know, the country is uh, facing record inflation. The erosion of middle class incomes to the point that it's just ridiculous. Uh, people are finding it difficult to buy base, your basic household staples such as onions and potatoes. Going out to eat whatever the average person in Turkey has essentially become a dream at this point. Um, you know, the level of corruption uh, is widely known in Turkey under the Erdogan government. Uh, nepotism, cronyism that has all gone into this. Everyone's basically aware of this. Plus the earthquake laid to bear just, you know, what the results of that corruption could be in the sense that the non-enforcement of city codes, building ordinance, whatnot, has laid to bear to waste millions of people's homes, like 10 million people have made, were made homeless after the February earthquakes, right? Um, so you would think that going into this election cycle, that the foremost things on people's mind would be these bread and butter issues. Hmm. That doesn't seem to be the case, right? Um, in the sense that at least one out of two voters seems to suggest that despite everything, that Mr. Erdogan's message was, and, you know, and, and, and his persona is the person to lead the country going forward. And Erdogan didn't necessarily campaign on an economic bread and butter issues based platform. He campaigned on a very divisive sort of um, uh, identity based issues. He's been on the, on, on the stump basically going forward and saying, if you vote for the other guy, right, then what you're gonna see is they're gonna close down our mosques. If you vote for the other guy, they're gonna allow same sex people to marry and destroy your family values. If you vote for the other guy, Kurdish terrorists are gonna roam free throughout the streets. Um, so one out of two voters seems to have bought that message, right? Um, whereas Mr. Kulish, they're all, you know, he's really has campaigned on, you know, rule of law, democratization, but also bread and butter issues. Uh, a little late in the game, he started that, but nevertheless, he did touch upon it. He got, he did get 45%, which does seem to say to you, the country is divided over this issue. Half the country may be, you know, economically depressed or whatever. But they believe this message of like, if I vote for the other guy, even though I'm hungry, I might not be able to go to the mosque. <laughs> so um, it's quite unprecedented because it, it's hard to say, but my guess is identity based issues were at the forefront of, of this election cycle. That's, that would be my initial guess. I'm, I'm going to take out prerogative and ask, ask my own question here. And, uh, and it might be completely off, off the mark. Uh, but it seems what you are suggesting is that the the um, the catalyst of the kind of political rivalries right now in Turkey is is more akin to a, the cultural war. Uh, how much do you see from your experience um, that this is becoming something global, not just in the U.S. and not even uh, just in Turkey? Because um, sometimes it seems to me that the that, that, that there is some sort of a cultural war that maybe started in the Anglo. Uh, American world, but now it's kind of being globalized in, in many other political contexts. It's a good question. I think one of the things that came to my mind when you were, when you were asking this was, you know, um, it's the sort of authoritarian's playbook, right? Right. Um, a lot of these authoritarian or would be authoritarian these don't necessarily have a strong sort of unifying message or a positive message to unify voters around, like a set of ideals into what better society looks like or what it should look like, you know, what our aspirations are, the city on the shining, top of the shining hill, all that sort of stuff. Instead, they play upon people's fears and grievances. And that seems to resonate with a lot of authoritarian leaders uh, and, 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 and its base voters. So in Erdogan's case, um, until this is the first election, I would argue that he has gone into when he has not been, when the country is not economically growing or voters feel economically better off and upwardly socially mobile than they did before. Erdogan has always campaigned successfully on a strong economic record and economic message and a growth cycle, right? Mm -hmm. This is the first time he's gone into it when Turkey is just economically melting down, right? And hence, as a result of that, this is the first time that he's overwhelmingly campaigned, I would argue, on a negative uh, and cultural war type of message that you mentioned, really playing along the fault lines and, and uh, of Turkish society and really sort of, you know, driving a dagger into this and trying to maximize. Has it worked? I would say it's worked pretty well for him, right? Um, I think it's, it's gotten him what he wants because there was no way for him to campaign on an economic message, right? I mean, he said things like, you know, he's acknowledged that inflation is a problem, but they, they're the best ones to handle it. But in the meantime, 
look, if you don't vote for us, they're also going to let the, the, you know, the crazy gay people, as he calls them, right? He calls the, he calls, um, the LGBTQ movement in Turkey this sort of debauched movement, right? That, you know, yeah, we might be economically not doing well, but if you vote for these guys, your families will be destroyed, see? So I think in the absence of strong unifying economic messages that they can campaign on, I think what global sort of uh, populists such as Erdogan or authoritarian or would be authoritarian leaders really sort of jump onto are these fault lines and you know and 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 and, and polarizing issues of identity, uh, and and which seems to resonate with a lot of voters. Um, touching on the issue of populism, the perfect way to to the next question. So Erdogan also uh, have been, have been known to capitalize on a global Islamist populism and, and centering himself. In his career as this uh, populist, charismatic um, Islamist a leader, uh, or uh, uh, or at least an inspiration or, uh, for for Islamist groups and, and networks uh, globally, and that had uh, a, a played a major role during the Arab Spring and also in the in the disputes between many Arab states in in Turkey. Um, were Kılıç uh, Dargulu uh, to win in the runoff? Uh, how would that affect uh, uh, Turkey's position in the uh, uh, network of, of global uh, Islamist influence? Will that be an end uh, uh, to Turkey's uh, uh, this, this Turkey role that Turkey played within the world of, of Islamism? Um, so that's a good question. So Mr. Kılıç is on record saying if he becomes president, um, that he would work um, very quickly to mend Turkey's relationship with its, uh, uh, I would say, Western partners or Western anchor. He said, you know, our, our, our aspiration, our, our momentum is towards the West. Uh, we will mend ties with our European partners as well as NATO, as well as the United States, right? That, that, that he's on record for saying that. And I think he firmly believes it. I think if he was to become elected, um, I don't think he's necessarily going to turn his back on to the Muslim world or the, you know, um, but I think, he, you know, Turkey's withdrawal from sort of closer relationships with trying to establish sort of Muslim Brotherhood type of entities and governments would basically come to an end. I think Turkey could essentially find a way to find you know, an amicable relationship with the Egyptian government, um, mm -hmm. as well as regional Arab states. But I think Turkey is going to basically you know, withdraw its footprint from trying to be a player in the region, so to speak, and really do focus its efforts on essentially working to remain its relationship with its Western partners. And that's not just an ideological preference. It's also from a perspective of numbers and, and, and money and dollars and cents, it makes sense. 60% of Turkey's entire foreign trade is with the West, right? Turkey's entire uh, security infrastructure architecture is within NATO as well as the Western hemisphere, right? It, it, it's easier to basically get, you know, re-engage with that than it is to essentially sort of go down these rabbit holes of, you know, do I have a dominant voice in who gets to govern Syria going forward? The answer is no. Uh, and does her, you know, would he be interested in going out on these sort of what I would call Looney Tunes sort of uh, adventures into into thinking that he can co-opt the Syrian government to give him exactly what he wants, um, you know, where to settle, you know, Arabs and where to settle Kurds inside of Syrian territory? No, I think Kalishtar wants out of this. Um, and he could do that quite easily in the sense, not easily, but he could, you know, he could do it. By saying, look, the, the the previous foreign policy exploits of the Turkish government were, were my predecessor, and I don't campaign on that, and I don't believe it. So, you know, I want to withdraw Turkey's military footprint in Syria, but you know, in return, here's what I would like, etc., uh, and and basically withdraw Turkey's sort of belligerent sort of stances in Syria, in Libya, uh, its belligerent stance also in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, but I think you know you would see a much more sort of visibly and rhetorically pro-Western approach if Kılıçdaroğlu was to be elected. Um, on that note, and the relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood and another Islamist group, what uh, will be the long-term political and security implications of the election of uh, Hezbollah members, uh, the Huda Par, uh, uh, to the Turkish parliament from the ranks yeah. of the AKP? So that's a good question. So to, let, let me just preface this. So. Hudapar does uh, uh, affiliate itself with Hezbollah, but it has nothing to do with the Hezbollah that you see in, in, in Lebanon or the region, right? Um, it's a Turkish branch of Hezbollah. It does have sort of linkages to, to Iran to a limited extent, but don't get me wrong, this is no sort of cuddly toy. Um, mm -hmm. This is a pretty nefarious entity, which is historically carried out assassinations of law enforcement officials, and they are on record for essentially saying, 
we don't want to just discuss the impose the imposition of Sharia based law in Turkey. We want to bring Sharia to Turkey, right? Uh, many of Erdogan's allies and and, uh, and 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 proponents were shocked going into this election cycle when Erdogan decided to include Hudapar, this Hezbollah affiliated party, into his alliance because they said, "Oh my God, this is a horrific entity." Erdogan just said they have nothing to do with anything they just you know a you know a, a good right-wing party um now that they have several members elected to the turkish parliament in by in in and of it in and of itself it doesn't it's not going to change anything in turkey i don't think but what it does say is the alliance of erdogan his mhp main big ally, ally partner but also this fringe party of, of hudapar having seats in parliament is a wider representation of right-wing extremism that's been represented in parliament going forward. That's the more worrying thing. I mean, the, the Turkish parliament now is more representative of far right-wing, xenophobic, anti-Western, uh, anti-secular sort of representation than it ever ha than there has been in recent memory. So this is quite worrying from that perspective. Uh, okay, can you talk me a, a little bit through that seeming contradiction that the parliament is increasingly right-wing extremist, uh, increasingly uh, uh, leaning towards uh, uh, religious extremism, but Erdogan seems to gain it, be gaining less support than he used to have in the past. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Erdogan's percentage of the vote, as well as his political party, the AKP, the Justice and Development Party, has seen a fall off in its vote uh, compared to the 2018 and previous elections. There's no doubt about that. I mean, they, they, you know, they've lost percent seven, eight percentage points last time I checked, but it doesn't matter. I mean, in the sense that in Parliament, the majority of seats still goes to the AKP, the MHP, and the Hudapar Alliance, right? So mm -hmm. they will control just over 320 seats out of the 600 chamber, right, um, going forward. So the bottom line is, the takeaway is, yes, they've lost some seats, and, and, and Erdogan has fallen in, in, in the percentage of votes. And contrastingly, historically, the CHP or the CHP candidate, Mr. 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 Kolesh you know, since 1950 in Turkey has never received a higher percentage of the vote. But again, it looks like right now, the parliamentary majority is in the hands of the right-wing, I would call extremists. Um, and the presidency is increasingly looking likely to go to Mr. Erdogan. And in terms of governance, just practical day-to-day -day governance, that is going to find a greater voice inside the Turkish parliament than, uh, than, than the moderate, or let's just say the more liberal democratic wing that the country has historically been accustomed to. Um, and again, we received also a, a number of questions asking, uh, okay, where uh, Kulut Chudergal were, were to win, uh, what would be his policy towards Israel? Huh, that's a good question. So, unknown. Uh, Mr. Kulut made a recent basic, recent statement saying, you know, we would continue relations, but we're not especially looking to, 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 um, to build a close relationship with Israel, um, uh, which which may have come, which may come, which may come as a shock to some, my own hunch about that is to to believe um, that that was election speak. Mm. I don't think he wants to be on record for his, you know putting forward a pro-Israeli sort of stance right now, were it to be elected. Because again, I think he feels vulnerable to the extent that Mr. Erdogan could hammer him, saying, not only is he in bed with the Kurdish terrorists. But he's also a big supporter of the Israeli Zionist cause. You know, he lets Erdogan basically lead the narrative, the electoral narrative, and he's always on the defensive, trying to second guess how he might be labeled by Erdogan, rather than taking the the, the strong sort of upper hand, so to speak. Uh, if you look across the sort of ranks of the CHP's, you know, his party's political foreign policy team, some of them are like retired ambassadors, uh, some of them are you know foreign policy professionals. They do espouse a pretty strong uh, pro-Israeli uh, relationship. So, for example, one of the senior sort of candidates uh, that was, I'm not sure actually if he won his seat, that retired ambassador Namak Tan, who was, who was also the former spokesman of the foreign ministry, but also Turkey's former ambassador to, to Israel, right? Uh, I believe between 2000, gosh, I can't remember when he was ambassador to Israel. Um, He's a very strong pro pro Israel uh, Turkey Israel sort of relationship, uh, and he was widely respected. He was also Turkey's ambassador to Washington, uh, and um, was was known to understand both Washington and Israel pretty uh, pretty well at the time, right? Um, 
he's a senior candidate. Uh, he may have won a seat because he was in a very plump spot for parliamentary status. Uh, so I think the CHP is more broadly representative of, of a strong sort of relationship between Israel and Turkey, but also domestically, let's not forget the CHP is typically the, the party which Turkey's own Jewish uh, uh, voters vote for, right? Because the party of Ataturk has historically been the guarantor of minority rights in Turkey. Um, and the CHP has always had a very strong showing with Jewish support. So um, that comes as no surprise. I just think going into the election cycle, Mr. Kulish you know, being a religious minority himself, um, has basically chosen to tamp down his sort of pro-Israeli views if he has them, mainly because he doesn't want to be shut down by Erdogan. Thank you. Uh, we received a question actually about the issue of the EU. Uh, is, the, is there now the, you know, any suggestion of a possibility of Turkey being admitted to the EU uh, dead? Not in my lifetime, and I'm pretty young. <laughs> <laughs> um, who knows? I mean, look, you know, the, the accession process of Turkey is still formally on track. Mm. In practice, it's dead on arrival. Uh, there's, no, there's, no, there's no movement whatsoever. Um, if Mr. Kulishro was to basically be elected, um, re-engagement with the, with, with the European accession process is, is something there that he can take advantage of. I think he'll find quite a lot of friendly voices and, and, in, in Europe to essentially you know, re-engage with Turkey on that footing, uh, but not necessarily any meaningful outcome because there is, you know, Turkey, is, you know, the European Union itself has a lot of diverse members now, not necessarily interested in including Turkey uh, going forward. But that would at least put Mr. Kulishor in a stronger position to renegotiate the terms of Turkey's existing relationship with the European Union. So Turkey is, all, is not a member of the European Union, but unlike any other non-member, Turkey is one of the most integrated members of the uh, uh, non-members into the EU. For example, Turkey is a member of the EU's customs union, which means that Turkish businesses and, you know, can, you know there's free movement of goods and services between Turkey and the European Union. Hmm. Turkey would like to expand that because one key element, which is not part of the customs union, which is agricultural product, products. Turkey would like to renegotiate the terms of the customs union so Turkey can export agricultural goods to, to Europe. Turkey would also have the right to negotiate a free movement of, of, of people, visaless travel for its citizens into Turkey, uh, which doesn't exist, unfortunately, uh, and Turks are subject to visa controls. And so if Mr. Kulisrola would be elected, rather than full membership in the short to medium term, Turkey could re-engage more meaningfully to establish these two sort of policy goals, which be a game changer for a, for, for a lot of Turkish sort of aspirations. Thank you very much, Sinan. And again, I want to thank all our audience who sent us questions. We're going to ask the last question now. Um, afterwards, I'll, I'll turn it to Sarah. Um, Syria. Um, there's been a, a talks between the Assad regime and Turkey um, uh, that were reported on, uh, said to be, to be held on Moscow. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, uh, the future of Turkish uh, Turkish policy towards Syria, uh, whether under Erdogan or, or uh, his opponents, especially after uh, uh, Syria's reintegration into into the Arab League? So, you know, bottom line, Mr. Assad hates President Erdogan, and they hate each other. I mean, it's understandable because up until two thousand seven, or sorry, until the beginning of the Syrian civil war. Um, Erdogan and Assad had really turned a leaf um, in terms of rekindling Turkish Syrian ties, which historically are very fraught. I mean, let's not mistake Turkey. Turkey has historically been ambivalent towards Syria. Um, during the Cold War, Syria was a very sort of uh, close ally of the, the Iron Curtain, whereas Turkey was a NATO country. There was a, there was, the border between Turkey and Syria was landmines, which NATO removed back in 2007, 2008, right? Um, that rapprochement between Syria and, and Turkey resulted in these sort of border towns in Turkey uh, really coming to life with like uh, hotels and shopping malls, which were flooded by Syrian tourists, right? They loved coming to Turkey. And then the Syrian uprisings began and, um, you know, Erdogan and, and, and Assad fell apart because Erdogan blamed Assad for the butchering of his own people. And Erdogan, you know, for the first time in Turkey's history, engaged in a process of regime change. He really went, he went hammer and tongs of trying to remove him. So now that, that that's not going nowhere and Assad is likely to stay in power, uh, the Russians uh, have really insisted that the Turks and the Syrians sort of shake hands and become friends, right? Or at least, you know, 
tolerate each other. So how is that going to happen? Well, we don't know. Um, Mr. Assad has basically just is sitting on the sidelines before shaking the hand of Erdogan in a photo op, just to basically see who's going to win this election. He's in no rush to like, you know, um, sit down and shake hands. He really loathes Erdogan. So if Kulishtoro wins, he'll be much happier. But let's say Erdogan wins, uh, which is the more likely scenario at this point. Uh, I think they will still pr- pr- they will still um, you know press ahead with 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 normalization. So they've each got a give. So right now, Mr. Erdogan basically would have to remove Turkish troops out of Syria. He would have to, and he would also have to stop backing these radical entities, which he has relied upon his, you know, for the last number of years to fight against the regime forces in Syria. Okay, but he's not going to just do that for free. What he also wants is be able to sort of face, say, Erdogan wants to say face with his own population. Turkey has close to 4 million refugees and the Turks, the Turkish people want those people gone, right? They want, they, they want, they said enough is enough. Um, so I don't want some sort of face saving measure of at least, even if it's symbolic numbers, tens of thousands of Syrian refugees being returned back to uh, Syria. And Assad's got to say yes to that. I don't think we're ever going to see those millions of people return home because most of them set up, set themselves up a life, a new life inside of Turkey, a new generation of Syrians have been born and raised in Turkey, going to Turkish schools. Um, and they don't want to go back to, to, their, to their sort of native land for fear of being butchered by the regime. Um, in, ret- in addition, uh, Turkey would also like guarantees from the Syrian state saying that the Syrian Kurds, right, will not seek to establish a home state for themselves inside of Syria or, at, you know, or, or secede a part of Syria that, that they can then use as a launching base to essentially attack Turkey for more, secession, for more of a secessionist cause. So Erdogan want, might, w- would like some sort of arrangement where something called the Adana Protocol, the Adana Agreement, which existed between Syria and Turkey, uh, is reinvigorated. That agreement basically says that Syria agrees to ensure that Kurdish insurgents don't um, compromise Turkey's sovereignty. And if they try, Turkey is authorized to uh, launch military offensive into Syrian territory up to 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers. I can't remember what that sort of thing was. But Turkey wants some sort of... Uh, and in return, what would they get? Well, you know, they would... Well, you know, the conflict would end. Uh, presumably over time, uh, Turkey could play a hand in the reconstruction of Syria because Turkey would like... Or Erdogan would like to have in the contract, being contract, you know, in, in the contracts, building contracts uh, or you know, of rebuilding Syria, a lot of raw materials that would need to go into Syria would have to go through Turkey, right? Of course, it took, it's a thousand kilometer border. It's, you know, Turkish border is absolutely essential for that. So um, I think what will happen is let's wait till the elections are over. And I think you knowing who's in charge then, the Russians will continue down this line of facilitating talks and um, essentially this sort of dance between uh, two unwilling uh, leaders who probably have to shake hands and move on. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sina. This was incredibly edifying. Um, thank you for your your years and years of brilliance and wisdom um, that you're okay. able to use to enlighten us um, about this very critical nation that controls a vast amount of territory and located in a um, very strategic area of the globe. Um, so I can't thank you enough. Um, um, those of you who are um, our listeners know that Annette does this every single week. We, If you enjoy what you're hearing, we really can use your support. Please go into our website at www.ametonline.org and know that every single day we do much more than have our weekly webinars, but we are have a very um, heavy presence on Capitol Hill, where we consult with members of Congress and their staffers um, about Middle East policy issues. Um, and um, please, while you are at it, if you can support the wonderful work of FDD, who is lending us Sinan City, go to fdd.org. Um, we, we work together with them. They are an amazingly um, wonderful think tank here in Washington, D.C. as well. And they have um, a, a huge array of um, equally talented and well-versed um, experts on many, many subjects. So um, 
Thank you. And uh, uh, Sinan, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to say thank you for having me. It was, a, it was a pleasure joining you and providing me the space. I would also say if, you, if you're interested in Turkey's elections, FDD tomorrow has an event on what just happened at Turkey's elections. And you, you can basically watch that. It's going to be streamed live. Um, and you can just go onto FTD.org to just, to just to sign up. It's, 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 it's a panel between myself. Uh, my colleagues, Howard Eisenstadt, Stephen Cook at this continental foreign relations, and another colleague, Sibal Oktay. Um, but it's at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, but, and you can just register and watch it online. And uh, it should be a fun event. Excellent, excellent. Um, we really enjoy a very deep collaboration with um, so many experts and scholars at FDG, and it will be a pleasure. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're going to sign off now. And Sinan, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Goodbye, folks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.